In far South America, in the extremities of Chile and Argentina, lurks Patagonia, a mystical region filled with deserts, mountains, vibrant neon lagoons, and glaciers. Exotic species of flora and fauna occupy the lands, with some native species that can't be found anywhere else on Earth. The sparsely populated region was also once home to a number of indigenous tribes. Patagonia got its name from Magellan, whose expedition claimed to have encountered giants twice the stature of ordinary people. He refers to them by the name Patagon in his writings. The giants, of course, don't actually exist. We made the journey to Patagonia in mid-December of 2021. My adventure buddy Alan and I had spent several days in Chile's Atacama Desert, where we witnessed the annual Geminid meteor shower. While there, I learned that Alan isn't exactly a morning person, but nonetheless, we voyaged into the empty desert on December 14th to take advantage of clear, dark skies. Each hour brought dozens of shooting stars and fireballs streaking overhead. But as daylight dawned and bathed the mountains in a wash of amber, we were already on to our next adventure, hopping a flight from Calama to Santiago. From there, we boarded a flight to Puerto Natale, some 1,300 miles to the south. The flight was scheduled to take about 3 hours 14 minutes, and having been awake since 1 a.m., it was the perfect opportunity to fall into a quick sleep. Two hours into the flight, I awoke to peer out the window. The snow-capped Andes Mountains soared to more than 15,000 feet, standing defiantly against a backdrop of turquoise and aquamarine. The lakes, lagoons, and rivers were filled with melting ice, some streaming off glaciers. This is the Perito Moreno Glacier. It occupies 97 square miles in Santa Cruz, Argentina, and is one of more than four dozen glaciers that comprise a South Patagonian ice field. It's also the second largest non-polar ice field in the world, only behind Alaska. It was part of the Patagonian ice sheet, which covered the entirety of southern Chile during the last ice age some 11,700 years ago. Nowadays, it's the world's third largest reserve of fresh water. Perito Moreno is one of only a few glaciers in the world that is maintaining its size or growing. That's because it accumulates mass at the same rate it loses it, allowing for a state of equilibrium. Across Chile and Argentina as a whole, however, the glaciers are rapidly retreating and shrinking, largely thanks to human-induced climate change. The end of the Perito Moreno Glacier, called a terminus, is just over 3 miles wide and about 240 feet thick. It's accessible via car, and tourists often drive in from the east to bask in its magnificence. To the right of the glacier is a lighter-colored grayish body of water known as the Browser Rico, or Rico Arm. The water here has no outlet to drain, and can sometimes rise 90 feet or more above the water levels of the Lago Argentino to the north. The buildup of water pressure periodically spurs enormous glacial ruptures every three to four years on average. The last big break occurred in 2019. Flying over it was incredible. It felt as if we were in the presence of a prehistoric giant, a sentient being. In a sense, we were. The air was uncharacteristically clear, affording an airborne view of something few people will ever witness in their lifetimes. As we continued south, a castle-like formation of craggy rocks came into view. They were reminiscent of giant earthen fingers prying at the sky. This is the Payne Massif. It soars to 9,462 feet above sea level and is the crown jewel and centerpiece of Chile's Torres del Paine National Park. The structure is made of yellowish granite wrapped in dark sedimentary rock. The pillar-like tower of stone monuments was formed about 12 million years ago by successive injections of magma from below. The landscape opened up into a dark green tundra as we began our descent into Puerto Notales, the main entry point to Patagonia. It's the capital city of the province of Ultimo Esperanza, or Last Hope. About 18,500 people live in the city limits, and another 2,000 reside in the surrounding rural countryside. The sky was adorned with whimsical white pancakes, saucer-like disks of cloud cover. The hockey puck formations were lenticular clouds. Layered air riding up and over the mountains was cooling and condensing to saturation before subsiding and drying up. That left small disks of saturated air. When you see lenticular clouds, it's usually a sign you're in the vicinity of some high terrain. Neighborhoods of Puerto Natales appeared below as we landed. We exited the plane into a brisk air mass with temperatures in the lower 50s. Even though it was summertime in the southern hemisphere, we were still at the tip of South America. While that made for cool weather, it also meant late sunsets. We were still enjoying daylight past 10 p.m. That said, we were very tired and sleep was calling our name. We had an early morning ahead. We awoke at 6 a.m. to board a small bus to Torres del Pine National Park. We were greeted by more lenticular clouds over the brownish-green landscape. At 9 a.m., our guide spotted something out the window that resembled an ostrich or an emu. This was a rhea, specifically a rhea penada. They're native to South America. 
They're flightless and silent, other than when mating, and they mainly eat leaves, roots, fruits, and seeds. Young rheas eat insects for the first few days after they're born. Of course, those weren't the only birds we encountered. A flock of massive condors, akin to vultures, lurked over a field to our west. They're among the largest flying birds on the planet and have wingspans of up to 10 feet. Most weigh up to about 30 pounds, and they fly as much as 200 miles per day at altitudes as high as 18,000 feet. They frequently hunt in packs. Unsurprisingly, that's what they were doing this particular day. They were Agne guanaco, one of two camelid species native to South America that had been hit by a car. Guanacos weigh between two and 300 pounds. It didn't take long before the condor's competition arrived though. A South American gray fox visited to feast. Guanacos aren't terribly shy. Most stand three to four feet tall with a body up to about seven feet long. They have several predators though, including pumas. It's not uncommon to spot a so-called sentinel guanaco on the peak of a hillside, keeping watch for the remainder of the pack. Nestled within the mountains were green lagoons home to flamingos. They may seem out of place, far removed from the tropics, but flamingos are common in the temperate zones of the South American high terrain. In the wild, flamingos can live up to 50 years. Patagonian flamingos are often regarded as more pink than their warm weather counterparts closer to the equator. The deeper we ventured into Torres del Pine, the more it felt as if we were journeying back in Earth's history. Scarping scars could be seen all over, the result of ancient glaciers carving and scouring the landscape. Signs warned of strong winds in the mountains, with gusts frequently topping 60 miles per hour. Picturesque waterfalls and rivers signaled melting ice. We passed Pejue Lake, died a faded blue by microorganisms, algae, bacteria, and sediments. Then we toured the Gray Lake, walking a half mile along a gravel strip of land before arriving at an island. The wind was intense and carried with it an icy bite. It was the cold, dense air chilled by the glacier funneling through the valley-like basin. Moisture in the locally cooled air mass condensed, with sporadic drops of frigid water falling from a patchwork, partly cloudy sky. Gusts rarely dip below 40 miles per hour. The next day, on December 16th, it was time to head back to Santiago. Alan and I boarded a Sky Airlines flight for a return trip northwards, which would make a connection in Puerto Montt. I made sure to book the window seat since we'd be flying over the glaciers once again. Alan requested the window seat, but like a toddler, he fell fast asleep. I took care not to wake the overtired child, instead craning my neck for a view out the window. Once the clouds thinned, the majestic topography once again dissolved into view. The familiar sights of the pain to massive greeted me, but I was more impressed by what came later on in the flight. I noticed a particularly vibrant lake as we looked east over Santa Cruz in Argentina. This was the Lago Viedma, named after Antonio Viedma, the first European explorer to visit its shores back in 1783. The lake is about 50 miles long, carved out millennia ago by since shrunken glaciers. Little vegetation remains, the stony soil and steep slopes unfavorable for most flora. The lake is fed by the Viedma Glacier, about 1.2 miles wide at its point of entry into the water. It's visually striking, made up of ribbon-like moraines, or stripes of entrained soil, rock, and silt. This NASA image shows them quite well. In addition, you might be able to make out cracks perpendicular to the glacier's motion. Those are the result of friction. The edges of the glacier are slowed by contact with the adjacent rock, while the middle of the glacier has less impeding it. That instigates a shearing strain within cross-sections of the glacier. Then we began our approach into Puerto Montt, just west of the Parque Nacional de Andino. The airstrip is on the west side of the city of more than 200,000. Our flight path took us past two volcanoes. Calbuco, 6,385 feet tall, is visible on the right or south. Oserno, standing to 8,701 feet, is to the north on the left. Calbuco is very much an active volcano. It erupted 10 times during the 20th century. Between 1893 and 1895, a lengthy eruption tossed debris more than five miles in distance. More recently, on April 22, 2015, Calbuco erupted again with little warning. Its outburst was estimated at a four on the Volcano Explosive Index, roughly matching the eruption of Mount St. Helens in force. Here's a satellite photo showing its eruptive plume in 2015. You can see the extensive shadow indicating its height. Ash towered to more than 50,000 feet above the crater, sparking a barrage of volcanic lightning. There was also some speculation that the volcanic eruption may have triggered a harmful algal bloom by depositing nutrients into the ocean around Patagonia. Here's one more shot as we depart of the volcanic region. About 20 minutes later, we flew west of Villarica and Pucón in Chile's Lake District. 
I visited back in December of 2020 for a total solar eclipse. Months of careful planning proved futile, however. A thick atmospheric river or filament of moisture snaking shore from the Southeast Pacific brought days of rainfall and cloud cover. While I did spend two minutes immersed in the moon's shadow, nothing was visible beneath the solemn overcast and somnolent gloom. Alan and I made it back to Santiago on the evening of December 16th and visited one of my favorite spots, the Teleferico, or chairlift. From there, stunning vistas, including the expanse of Santiago skyline flanked by the mountains, sprawl out in a cluttered yet comforting panorama. After an overpriced fine dining experience that involved eating ornamental sticks and snarfing down charcoal, we explored the city one final evening before flying back to the States. I tend to get sad at the conclusion of every trip, but I relish the fact that there will always be another just around the corner. At the end of the day, you can't take money with you. It's the places, people, and shared memories that count. I'll always be chasing adventure. For my radar, I'm meteorologist Matthew Capucci. Follow my radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download my radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.